Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. Right. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Iron Radio listeners are an experienced, clever lot who are in tune with their bodies and whom I'd like to crowdsource regarding a new study and an invention of mine. This is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. I've been fortunate to have a provisional patent granted regarding a coffee methodology that is research supported to either enhance the anabolic effect of meals or to support cognition in a unique way. It's not a pill or a powder, but rather a fascinating way to brew coffee that may surprise you. And that's just part of the story. This is a very early stage bucket list sort of achievement that I cannot undertake alone. If you're interested in getting further educated on functional coffee and health, I'm asking that you email me at lonman7 at hotmail.com to get involved. We'll have a brief email exchange that will get the ball rolling on something I think you'll find both fun and beneficial. I need your rare combination of traits. So thank you 50 times. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and sports nutrition professor, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. Yeah, this is Bill Stevens. I run Strength Guild, powerlifter, Island Games athlete, and coach all over the nation coming up. So, sounds like it. Busy, busy. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson. Uh, I want to extreme human performance, greater the flex diet. Cert, a uh, faculty member at the Kerrig Institute, and I'm recording this in early, early Hood River, Oregon this morning, uh, hanging out on the front porch here, not to wake everyone else up. <laughs> oh, that's cool, though. There you go. Yeah. Get your cup oh, of coffee. Oh, yeah, right. I got my little coffee here. I actually went with some, some chameleon vanilla cold brew, which is one of my new favorites. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I think there's actually one of our tidbits is on coffee. And I didn't go fetch this, right? This stuff comes across my desk. It really does. Because um, people are like, you guys are just such coffee, you know, nuts and caffeine and stuff. <laughs> we do enjoy it. I mean, all of us drink it. Obviously, it has utility if you're interested in lifting. But, you know, I mean, it's the number one drank beverage in the world. Uh, and, you know, it, it just happens. <laughs> coffee happens. So, <laughs> all right. Let, we're going to do some uh, episode of mail and news, everyone. It's just building up. And we'll have the usual commentary and whatnot. So probably just go to break sort of randomly, maybe after the the listener questions. So let's start with those. Strength and Muscle Sport News. Uh, This first one is from Ben. He says, uh, hey, long time listener. I've heard you guys give product reviews and commentary at times in the past. And I thought you might have something to say about the product I'm attaching in these photos. Uh, My wife has been taking it for what it's worth. She enjoys it. Just wanted to know uh, if you thought it was actually beneficial. Now, I know this is hard for you guys because you're not looking at these photos, but it's a Primal Kitchen Collagen Fuel. It's a vanilla coconut flavored, but essentially it's collagen, right? Um, And then Ben sent some pictures. It's got of the label. It's got like the amino acid profile. Um... Which I actually I found kind of odd, really, right? Because collagen is not exactly known for its, you know, high dose, complete protein kind of amino acid profile, but it's on there. Um, essentially, there's there's some claims about you know it's just a it's tasty. It's a tasty way to get collagen. One of the things that concerned me was the on the nutrition facts panel. It says protein ten grams, and I think we need to be careful, Ben, because ten grams of of what, right? So it's a collagen product is in some ways to me, at least when you're thinking about muscle protein synthesis, almost like nitrogen spiking, if you've heard of that, and we've touched on that in months past, but with nitrogen spiking, they'll put one amino acid in large amounts or, you know, a fairly incomplete, what's usually not considered a very high quality protein like collagen, and it, it jacks up the grams number right in the protein section of the nutrition facts panel. Uh, so that 10 grams, eh, meh, you know, 
Um, there's two and a half grams of fat, et cetera, like one gram of carb. It's essentially just a collagen uh, product. It's got a couple of you know tidbits, uh, very tiny amounts of some other nutrients in it, but nothing to really write home about. Um, just this morning, I, I was talking to Kelly. I, I actually had Kelly get me some low sodium bone broth uh, because to me, in some ways, that's like poor man's collagen product. Um, you know, I may or may not be up on a lot of the specific stuff with collagen. I know there's been a lot of claims about it in the past with joints and or even appetite suppression because protein is satiating and I think collagen can supply a little bit of that. Phil, didn't you say you or your wife were making bone broth as well lately? Is that right? Yeah, we drink we drink some of it. I mean, it's uh, why uh, an alternative to a warm drink in the winter, I guess, to coffee. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but I mean, it's just and then like if she gets a cold, she'll have it. It helps her throat, things like that. Oh, but, okay, okay. Yeah, not I'd, to get jacked or anything. No, right. I didn't know if you were doing it because you know, like I was saying that you know, am I going to get a little bit of you know, collagen or something uh, in me that way, or you're right, just culinary wise, it's nice to have a savory, warm drink. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, uh, Mike, what do you know about uh, collagen supplements and would you take them? Yeah, so there was a very interesting talk a guy gave at the NSEA Nationals meeting last week on all about soft tissue, and he covered some of the stuff that I've looked up before too, which was super cool. Um, <clears throat> I think collagen can be useful. It just depends on what you're using it for. Yeah. Exactly what you said, Monty, is that historically collagen and gelatin and all of those were not really used much at all because they're incomplete. They're low in leucine for muscle protein synthesis. I've talked to you know Stu Phillips about this too, is that it's just not that useful for muscle recovery. Um, but there's some super interesting work from uh, Dr. Keith Barr's lab in California. Uh, one of the other researchers I believe you can look up is Shaw, S-H-A-W, where they were giving, in this case, actually gelatin, small amount of vitamin C uh, before training, so about 60 minutes before, and seeing that the amino acids would actually show up in soft tissue. So that's like one of the only, I think, two studies have shown that, but it had to be, in this case, uh, before lifting is when they found that it was most useful. So I played around with that a little bit. I'm going to try to do an experiment uh, more with that because I'm wondering if soft tissue turnover may be a limiting case, especially in injury or maybe just in overall strength progression, Yeah. You know, especially in more advanced lifters. You know, muscle recovery is about 90-ish days in terms of turnover. Uh, soft tissue turnover is probably closer to nine months or maybe somewhere around there. Um, and they were saying that you could even do something simple like just jump rope for, I think it was only like five to eight minutes, and then have collagen or gelatin before. Uh, collagen and gelatin from an amino acid profile are pretty similar. And there's some interesting stuff that glycine, while it's not an essential amino acid, might be rate limiting in certain cases. Mm -hmm. So another thing I've done with clients who are trying to save money is you could play around with using collagen or gelatin and maybe adding glycine to it. And then a little trick from the dietary supplement world is uh, glycine in high amounts is actually very sweet. So if you want something that's a little bit sweeter but not wanting to add sugar for whatever reason, uh, that may work too. So I think it's useful. Again, it depends on what you're trying to do with it. You know, if you're using it for muscle recovery eh, and yeah. uh, appetite suppression, maybe. You know, yeah. we talked about that in the protein and dietary uh, resistance exercise training book yep. that we yep. you know you edited a couple of years ago. So, yeah, yeah, right on. I think it's about goal. That that's very true, right? I mean, bone broth. I'm trying to remember all the things. There's different minerals, and there are some things in bone broth that could be good. Yeah. Like I said, I don't. I don't think I personally, when the rubber hits the road, I would buy an expensive collagen mm -hmm. powder. Um, but you're right. There's some interesting things you're trying to almost trying to find use for collagen, right? Because it's it's in a lot of ways it's something that should be a cheap uh, protein. Uh, there's been some stuff like you said. We need to be careful and not just say cartilage and joints, but you know you have connective tissue like the soft tissue lining of the gut. There's a lot of different things that you know maybe there's something there. Um, I don't know. So 
there you have it. I mean, like I said, I wouldn't focus on the amino acid profile intensely. Like I, sometimes they just put that uh, on the label to make it look like, oh, look at all these amino acids. And if you look closely, oh, well, there's like a 75 milligrams of this or that amino acid, you know, like non non-useful amounts, at least as far as protein synthesis goes, or some of the you know more common amino acids. Sometimes those little amino acid profiles are like, well, whatever, you know, but. <laughs> But um, yeah. I, I do want to offer this. Uh, in the mornings, now, two summers ago, I blew up my left knee, almost definitely tore my medial meniscus there. Um, I was never really diagnosed, but I'm not wrong about this. I know that's what happened. Um, and I take a 250 milligram vitamin C. I take two um, glucosamine chondroitin MSM tablets from Sam's Club. Uh, and I take a swig of bone broth. I kind of swish them down with some bone broth, and I do it every morning. And now I also take curcumin and other anti-inflammatories and stuff like that. But I'm trying to prolong uh, the usefulness of this left knee before I have to go get something done. You know, inject mm. some weird injection or get God. You know, eventually I guess it'll be knee replacement. But you know, damn it, it was the running that did it. And I was bitching about that two years ago. I was crawling to the bathroom. My entire like nervous system down on that side just shut down. It was ridiculous. But uh, I do find, and this is very, you know, N of one subjective, but when I do, when I take my curcumin regularly and I do my little vitamin C, glucosamine, bone broth thing in the morning, and um, it doesn't hurt. And I don't know if that's what's doing it. I mean, like I said, I do occasionally take ibuprofen and other things, but uh, there may be something to that with, um, like, like you said, Mike, I'm sure with the soft tissue turnover, and I, I just do it in a very chronic way preventive way to try to increase the lifespan of that joint of my left knee but maybe something there um I, yeah you usually lift after that because i know you usually lift in the morning don't you lonnie well I, yeah in, in the summer i usually lift like um about lunchtime you know oh, okay. um but no but you're right i go for a walk pre-breakfast walk and at, yeah. least, at least there's that you know just yeah, kind of stress on it exactly kind of compress yeah. it and get some fluids sloshing in there <laughs> i guess so, um, since we're talking about turnover, tissue turnover, this next mail is from Frank. He says, hello, how are you? Uh, you guys are my go-to guys for this kind of stuff. Real science, uh, not just bro. I've been reading uh, MPS, right, muscle protein synthesis stuff, uh, and it, how it, it lasts up to 24 to 48 hours. So I've been reading and hearing uh, lately, if you work out hard, uh, or with volume or let's say with heavy intensity boosters quote unquote and I think he means actual exercise techniques not not supplements um, you may not recover in time he says so if it takes 48 hours or longer to heal your you will miss your growth window is this true thanks Frank now I'm not sure exactly what you mean here Frank um, if you do get wrecked I mean, really sore, lots of micro trauma, that kind of stuff, lots of volume. Um, yeah, your, I mean, muscle protein synthesis and recovery, I think that's going to be prolonged. I've never actually seen the data. I, I talked to Nick Bird about it once, and I'm getting sort of this confirmation that, yeah, it's probably not just the 24 to 36 hour protein synthesis window like Duncan McDougall did back in the day. He was my advisor's advisor, right? One of the first people to look at stable isotopes and this window of muscle protein synthesis. Uh, Nick, if I remember right, was suggesting that, yeah, that would be prolonged, as you might guess, right? There's a lot of tissue, quote unquote, damage when you do like negatives and, you know, lots of volume. Uh, I don't worry that much, frankly, about some really narrow window of protein synthesis. If, if you're training more than once a week, you know, whatever muscle groups that are stimulated are, you know, something's going to be in that muscle protein synthesis window, right? So that's why we do body part splits in bodybuilding or you train different movements in powerlifting. It seems like you're just rotating through, but you're always more or less, there's some local area around your body that's going to be... Uh, growing like that so you know I, I think you kind of hit it accidentally just because of life um, but yeah I, I don't know Phil how do you address that I'm guessing you just try to eat a lot of protein regularly knowing that something some part of your body is always repairing does that sound fair? yeah I mean we're generally always in a state of disrepair yeah so yeah 
especially my people <laughs> training, especially my people training for meets. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's you need to be consistent with training and consistent with diet. I mean, that's I try and get people to find a diet they can live with, mm-hmm. as well as a training plan they can live with, because we can't. It doesn't. One day of hard training isn't going to do anything for you. It's 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 volume and consistency over time is where we see the best benefit. Same thing with your diet. Yeah. You know, crash diets are great uh, for short term, but in the long term, no matter what, we need to find something you can live with. Yeah, so. the only thing that I can think of here is if you did that, like we talked a few weeks ago, like a once a week, just three hours on a Saturday and just heavy lifting, just get mm-hmm. wrecked. Yeah. Then you might think, yeah, listen, if I did that on Saturday, maybe Sunday, Monday, I better take some extra. Or if you're really sore, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. You know, I've I've measured muscle recovery out to five days. Mm-hmm. Most markers are starting to reset pretty well by day four. And again, that's with brutal. I ran people downhill for 45 minutes on a treadmill, really wrecked them. I've done fairly high volume negative benching and squatting and just ruined mm-hmm. college age lifters. And yeah, I mean, a lot of the blood damage markers and stuff, it could take four uh, days to reset. Some markers even longer than that. But but again, then you got to you got to think about, well, how do I realistically set up a training program like this if I'm, you know, if it, if it takes four or five days to recover? Uh, anyway, uh, long story short, unless you're just training once a week, I think the, the whole idea of rotating body part or, or movement splits, you're always in one of these windows. Uh, but, Mike, what do you think about this? <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, all the stuff on muscle protein synthesis, I mean, I read a fair amount of it, and it's very fascinating. It kind of gives you a little window into what's going on. Um, it's been argued that it doesn't necessarily, like you said, Bonnie, match the recovery process exactly. Yeah. And if you compare some of the chronic uh, long-term studies, again, Stu Phillips' lab has done that and others, uh, again, muscle protein synthesis is useful, but again, it's just telling us a little kind of snapshot uh, picture of what's going on over that time course. It's probably different time courses and stuff too. Um, in terms of practicality, I agree with you guys. Is if you're training real hard, yeah, maybe you bump it up a little bit more, but you're probably going to want to be in the three to five meals. You know, eh. I tell you know lifters, you know, 40 grams. If it's a smaller female lifter, maybe 30 grams of protein at each meal. So even if you're at 40 grams, if you're at a little bit more of a incomplete protein source, like rice protein as a supplement, you're gonna get it more than enough and it's gonna be enough to trigger muscle protein synthesis. And then with training, I think in protein, it's kind of sort of a mute point because even if someone came to me and says, hey, you know, my goal is, you know, kind of performance and body comp, but I'm gonna be gone or doing something crazy for a week and I can't lift at all, I'm probably not going to tell them to eat less protein. I'm probably going to tell them to eat the same amount of protein anyway. Yeah. You know, if the, the dude bra next to him comes in and says, yeah, I'm going to lift four days a week, probably going to be here on the same amount of protein right. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in practice, I think it kind of comes down to if you get the leucine threshold in, you know, the 2.5 to 3.5 grams, you get enough essential amino acids at each meal, repeat that you know, three to five times per day or maybe a little higher if you want to go super crazy and you're going to be good. Right. Yeah, I think I think too many people stress the minutia over little windows. Yes. Yeah. What's really important is... Day in and day out. Big habits day in and day out over the yeah. long haul. So... Yeah, the, the whole history of that. In fact, we, I think we had uh, Dave Barr on the show years ago yeah. talking about the windows of opportunity and, you know, because he's been actually... a at times critiquing that you know like the history of that was that oh look you resynthesize glycogen more quickly after a workout right so the carbohydrate window was sort of a big thing and then a lot of the protein synthesis like back you know mcdougall um lemon tarnopolsky they started showing similar stuff with protein like oh look there's this interesting time where you've triggered you've triggered some growth right but yeah in a practical client world um, where you're training more than twice a week, let's say, um, yeah, it does become sort of a, a moot point, like you said, Mike. So long as you're getting your, you know, 30 or 40 grams of protein at every meal, you're eating four times a day, maybe five, you're probably good. But yeah. uh, you know what? To Frank's point, though, it's cool that you're reading about that because it's it's interesting oh, totally. to know, right? You, the, knowing the mechanisms about what's happening in your body is really smart because then you can decide for yourself, you know. 
you know, I want to go for that as whey protein, something real fast right after I lift, or I want to do it before and after the training sessions, or or whatever it might be. It's fun to manipulate these things and see what happens to you, right? So, yeah, I think that word becomes useful is if, for example, like I'm traveling and stuff now, and I know that if it's harder for me to get protein if I get 20 grams of a whey protein that at least acutely in the studies it's going to match 40 grams so I'm going to be okay if I got a little bit lower amount of protein as long as it's you know super high quality for a short period of time is it optimal as much as I hate that word um, I'm probably going to be okay it's probably not going to be that big of a difference you know over time instead of just going ah I can't get any protein in I'm screwed uh, you know yeah. the downward spiral yeah, the quality thing is something clinically we'll do with like kidney patients, for example, right? Yeah. Like you, you're not going to feed them enormous amounts of vegetable protein and, and have their damaged kidneys work with that. And again, healthy kidneys are not harmed by high protein diets. They're not. Let's get put that behind us. But people with already, you know, hypertension, diabetes for decades, their kidney function is really slow. Their GFR is really slow. Uh, we give them lower amounts of really high quality stuff, meaning all the essential amino acids, right? Rich in leucine, the branch chains, all the all the essential amino acids. So there's, it's just, and again, there's that word, but optimal, yeah, where you, you know you're getting the most bang for the buck, and you're not just processing huge amounts. But again, in healthy people, I don't know, it, it kind of who cares? Just I don't like if I'm going to get seven grams of protein out of my serving of pasta. It's not the highest quality, it's a lot of gluten, whatever. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll add it to the protein total of that meal, you know, whatever. So, sounds a little flippant maybe, but it, yeah, it's it's good to actually come full circle with the science, so. Um, all right, uh, one more uh, bit of mail here. Uh, this is um, from Ronnie, and actually, Phil, you sent me this, thanks for that, because somehow I didn't get this. But he says, um, or let's see, the listener says, uh, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing this study that my old training partner and friend Mike Lawrence recently completed. Uh, it's on unstable load training in the overhead press. Now, I don't want to pigeonhole you, Mike, but I start thinking about you and all your very <laughs> varied ways you work out. <laughs> um, uh, he also headed up similar studies with the squat and bench press. Uh, he's headed a biomechanics research lab at the University of New England. Uh, came to us from Ball State in Indiana, trained at Westside uh, for a while, as well as trained with Matt Wenning. Uh, most importantly, truly outstanding guy, currently runs a private gym in Maine. Uh, oh, and he'd be good to have on the show. Well, I'll keep that in mind for sure. Um, anyway, so in the trenches kind of guy, like I said, there's been a lot of, this is um, well accomplished power lifter. Uh, I'd be grateful if you want my sharing the study. So. Just quickly, the title of this is Activity of Shoulder Stabilizers and Prime Movers During an Unstable Overhead Press. And again, it's by Williams uh, et al. Um, Department of Physical Therapy from University of New England in Portland, Maine. So, uh, quick setup here with the abstract. Overhead reaching is a common movement that relies heavily on muscles for dynamic stability. Stabilizer muscle activation uh, increased during squatting and bench pressing with an unstable load, but again, we don't know as much about overhead pressing, so that's the purpose of this study. I think in a nutshell, they took 12 guys. Uh, they this, These weren't real heavy lifts. They were 50% loads um, for 10 reps, and they did it over three conditions here, it looks like. Uh, a straight, stable barbell, and honestly, I am a fan of just barbell work, um, but also straight unstable barbell with kettlebell suspended from elastic bands. Mm -hmm. And then finally, an unstable earthquake bar with kettlebells suspended by elastic bands. Uh, so, and they looked at muscle activity. Um, bottom line here, if I kind of move to the bottom conclusions, therefore the EU, the unstable earthquake bar with the um, kettlebells suspended may be effective exercise to activate scapular stabilizers. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, Mike, thoughts from you on the, you know, overhead pressing with unstable bars? 
Yeah, I mean, I'll do more, a lot more unstable work on upper body versus lower body. Um, I haven't looked at the literature for about a year, but most of the literature when I looked before kind of matched that. If you think about what happens in the real world, unless you're in an earthquake, you know, the earth underneath you is probably not moving that much. But we do pick up and handle kind of all sorts of odd objects with our upper body. Um, so I've used them as an accessory work. Uh, we've got a little band system, like exactly what they did, all dangle kettlebells off the end of a bar. I don't have an earthquake or tsunami bar, but I think as accessory work, especially if you've got someone who maybe their upper you know, position in terms of their overhead press is not the greatest, and I want to load it, but I want to make it a little bit more difficult for them, but I don't want to add a high amount of load. You know, I'll dangle kettlebells from bars or... I also like having people do walking exercises with that. So you can do like a zercher carry and then put, so zercher is where you have it in the elbows and then you can hang kettlebells off the end of that and try to walk and that's just brutal. Um, but I think it can be useful for that and obviously it's a cool study comparing different levels of instability in terms of muscle recruitment. Um, so yeah, I think it can be useful for that. I wouldn't say I use it all the time per se, but for some people and as accessory work once in a while. and. If you've never tried it, the first few reps, even with a light load, it feels weird as hell. Oh, <laughs> it's like, I can whoa, imagine. it's going all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I, I don't do a lot of that kind of stuff. I, when I do overhead pressing, it's just with a, a barbell, really. You know, I don't get that fancy. But then I can I could see this kind of coming into play with stuff like rotator cuff or like injury prevention because you're trying to get those stabilizers. I mean, obviously your shoulder is going to be prone to injury because of the nature of that joint, but... Um, Phil, do you, do you do much instability kinds of stuff, or you just do no, not a barbell? ton? I mean, it only makes sense. I mean, this is another one of those studies where I think the the lab is meeting up with real world. Yeah, um, or even catching up. We kind of know yeah. that when something's shaking around, I have to work harder to hold it in place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, um, no, I mean it makes sense. I don't do a lot of it. Um, uh, partly because I, I mean I don't see a huge need if I have somebody un unstable like I have guys do overhead carries things like that that Mike was talking about to stabilize the shoulders a lot um, I, it's a risk for, versus reward thing you know if I have 14 kids putting shaky things over their heads eh, I don't know man I can't watch them all that <laughs> oh, as a coach so, right <laughs> that thing. so yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't like injuries and I could see how this could exasperate that a bit if not watched very closely. That would be ironic, so, wouldn't it? You're doing stuff to increase sto shoulder stability and prevent injury and you yeah. cause one <laughs> in your efforts yeah. to prevent them. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be the tough thing is is that. But I mean, I think like you said in a rehab, prehab yeah. type situation where you have somebody with an existing problem when we're, we're trying to address that, yeah, it could be very useful. Yeah, they're, or they're in a sport that just, well like uh, I just, when we were in Dublin, right, one of the the talks was about how coffee increases the velocity in, in, in overhand pitching, you know. So you think about some of these sports, I, I imagine that you would be at risk. So it's, it's like Mike said, it's neat to look at the different levels of how you address instability and purposely trying to trigger some of those stabilizers and stuff. So, yeah. And in theory, you could throw that in maybe super light as part of a warm up if you know someone's got a few issues with their overhead press. Um, I've done that a few times and anecdotally people say that their performance was better and it feels easier but that could just be all perception too right because you were trying to move something that's very unstable and now I give you something stable of course it's gonna feel better yeah you know yeah. but it, you know if you can increase the motor unit recruitment and get a little bit more activation per se around the shoulder yeah maybe it's useful for a couple of light sets as a, a warm-up type thing people can play around with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, after the break, we're actually going to talk about perception. Perception is a lot, right, when it comes to a lift or uh, even, even nutrition stuff. And I'll explain what I mean uh, when we get back. Hey, listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you, uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle. Oh, you poor meathead. All that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world 
and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that. And uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single digit uh, royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. Okay, everybody, we are back and I've got a, uh, it's an article on a study. That I, the people were wanting Lonnie and Mike's uh, opinions on, and I figured this is a good one because I think it's going to set them off a little bit. So, <laughs> I'll start with just the title: um, "Fat Consumption Is the Only Cause of Weight Gain." Mm. <sighs> scientists, <laughs> 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 scientists from the University of Aberdeen and Chinese Academy of Sciences have undertaken taken the largest the largest study of its kind looking at what components of the diet, fat, carbohydrates, and protein, cause mice to gain weight. Um, and when it comes down to it, the study was published in the Journal of Cell Metabolism, and it included 30 different diet variants that vary in their fat, carbohydrate, and sugar contents, um, and protein. The mice were fed these diets for three months straight, which is the equivalent to nine years in humans. In total, over 100,000 measurements were taken and were made uh, body weight changes, and their body fat was measured using a micro MRI machine. The uh, professor John Speakman, who led the study, said the result of this enormous study was unequivocal. The only thing that made mice get fat was eating more fat. Um, so, uh, yeah, carbohydrates, including up to third. Oh no, we need to get down here. So, the impacts. The summary. The impacts of different micronutrients on the body or macronutrients on the body regulation remained unresolved, with different studies suggesting increased dietary fat, increased carbohydrates, particularly sugars, or reduced protein may all stimulate overconsumption. We exposed these mice to 29 different diets varying from 8.3 to 80% fat, 10 to 80% carbohydrates, 5 to 30% protein, and 5 to 30% sucrose. Only increased dietary fat content was associated with elevated energy intake and getting fat. The response was associated with increased gene expression of the 5-HT receptors and dopamine and opioid signaling pathways in the hypothalamus. We replicated the core findings in four other mouse strains. Uh, the mice, mice regulate their food consumption primarily to meet energy rather than protein target. But the system can be overridden by hedonic factors linked to fat, but not sucrose consumption. Mm. I think in people, free living people, I, I mean, one of the biggest issues here is you're feeding a mouse in a cage, you know, kind mm -hmm. of thing. And in, in the real food industry is built on combinations of refined carbohydrates and fats, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I suppose if you were eating sugar with almost no fat in your diet, that'd be, that'd be a little bit different than the way the real world works, right? Which is you're eating combinations of sugar and fat, ice cream, 
you know, uh, things like that, delicious combinations of refined carbohydrates and fat. So, uh, you know, the practical a applicability of something like that, I think, is tough. Obviously, fats have more calories in every gram, so you got to watch them sort of carefully. I mean, physique athletes, of course, even stuff like peanut butter, if you're on a diet, you got to be careful with that. You know, I've known people that look at that literally a tablespoon of peanut butter like a treat, and I think they're doing that because, you know, it does add up pretty fast. Now, if you're trying to put on mass, that's to your advantage, right? But, um, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Here's my problem with the high sugar constant intake. With the, I mean, when people get coffee, they don't drink coffee like I have in front of me. They drink syrup, you know, syrupy yeah. caramel, macchiato, this and that. When they, they drink sugary pops, they eat refined carbohydrates. When you're in a high insulin state all the time, and I've said this before on the show, and I show data when I teach classes like advanced nutrition, but you start to turn on fat storage machinery. There are enzymes like acetyl-CoA carboxylase, enzymes that literally build fat. And so if acutely, insulin is a storage hormone, and it blunts fat breakdown, it blunts fat loss. And then chronically, it actually reprograms you to be a better fat storing machine. And when we're always in a high insulin state, that's one of the reasons in the past I've taken like Fridays, I've done sort of uh, uh, fasting, like just a low dose leucine protein kind of, you know, fast, almost a pulse fast, like Chris Shugart used to used to sort of um, support, just to get my body out from under the insulin pressure all the time of eating, 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 especially from tons of, of sugars and whatnot but so i i don't know mike what do, you, what do you think about this it's a sticky topic isn't it yeah yeah i mean i think of insulin as more of a fuel selector switch which i stole from jeff bullock mm -hmm. uh, so very similar right so high amounts of insulin all the time uh does push you to use more carbohydrates but pushes you away from fatty acid use yeah and so lower levels of insulin pushes you back to using fats uh as a fuel again so i have uh, done that with you know even people on pretty you know hypercaloric diets especially if they're a little bit more worried about health or body comp I'll have them you know take 18 to 24 hours once per week you know do do a longer fast right and I'm trying to drive insulin super low during that time and kind of give them the opposite stimulus for a little while and obviously you're cutting out a whole bunch of calories on that day too uh, in terms of the mouse study I think it's kind of interesting, but only I'd have to look at the, what actual mechanisms they looked at because I would hope that that was the goal of the study. Because um, like you said, Lonnie, in, in humans, we kind of know what hyperpalatability is, right? High amounts of fat, high amounts of salt, and high amounts of sugar all right. crammed together. Yep. So in the, mm -hmm. the rat study or the mouse study, it looks like it was what foods are the most kind of hedonic, and then I'm not sure what they looked at for energy regulation, so it appears that fat, the mice ate more of that, and maybe they just didn't correspondingly move around as much either. Um, so interesting yeah. from a mechanistic standpoint, but I'm not sure how it relates to humans, and I'm afraid that we're going to see all sorts of stuff now that says, oh, this and that about fat, and mm -hmm. it's going to be a mouse study, and it's going to drive me insane. <laughs> there's 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 two more there's two more quotes that I found pretty interesting here too, that adding carbohydrates to the fats from sugar had no effect. Um, combining sugar with fat had no more impact than fat alone on making them heavier. Mm -hmm. And then this one, there's no evidence that they're suggesting a protein target, whether it be wow. a high protein didn't uh, satiate them more, and mm. low protein down to 5% uh, didn't simulate greater uptake. So they found no protein target. I would actually wonder about species differences because yeah. ages ago I remember reading that rodents can self-select certain nutrients that they might be deficient in, whereas people aren't so good at that, right? We're pretty good at hitting a, a calorie target every day, I mean, self-regulating uh, if you don't bring the f triggers from the food industry in on it, right? Because we're being mm -hmm. bombarded with temptation. And the oh, yeah. the rats are, or the mice, it sounds like, they. It, now, I have to read this paper, I guess. But if it's just 
free eating and how much you eat and when you stop and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I let's put it this way: there's there's no way as a human being that I'm gonna I'm gonna eat tons of sugar and fat at the same time, you know, unless I'm doing it very purposely just to have fun, <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> uh, but I, I think the training for our listeners, the training is a huge part of this too. Like Mike was saying, maybe when they ate a lot of fat, they got sluggish or they didn't move around as much. I mean, obviously, if you bring exercise into the picture, and exercise, of course, is not random. Exercise is purposeful, repetitive, planned kind of activity that we do, and that changes the way and enhances the way your body uses both fats and carbohydrates, you know, like GLUT4 translocation, right? You take up blood glucose better during the exercise. You build more mitochondria, so you're a better fat-burning machine, all that kind of stuff. So you get structural adaptations from training, and, and that's not, you know what I mean? It, it, comparing us to mice, let's face it, rodent research is, is valuable. It is, but in, a, in an environment that's, if it is about self-selection and free feeding, it's really hard not, not to look at the psychosocial aspect of a lot of this, uh, you know, with, yeah. with people. Um, Mice don't have a holiday season. Exactly. Yeah, that's <laughs> one example. Yeah, totally. You know, or ads in their face for, um, yeah. you know, whatever, the latest um, sugary uh, pseudo coffee kind of thing. Yeah. So. Isn't there a big species differentiation with protein feeding in terms of response to mice versus humans? And I, I'm not the one to answer this, but I want to say there is something that sticks in my brain that there's a pretty massive difference on that, but maybe some mouse researcher in that area can correct me. You know, I know for a fact, I mean, I did my dissertation with a very particular fat, right, with CLA, and yeah. what it does to I mice think- is radically different metabolically than what it does to people. Uh, yeah. researchers would say human beings are, are hypo responders, you know, so mice will lose like half of all their body fat when you feed them that stuff in like eight weeks. It's ridiculous. And then human beings might lose, uh, literally a pound or two over a 15 week period, you know, so their livers, uh, operate differently. If you look at like rats, mice, and people, the, the percentage of their organ mass, it's liver is different metabolically. They're just kind of, you know, different, I guess. Um, the NIL I, rates are massively different between mice and humans. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, rodents tend to grow it, it, linearly, like almost throughout their lifespan, whereas people grow up and level off for a much longer part of their lifespan. So there's a lot of species stuff maybe going on here. It is interesting, though. It's fun to get insights like that. Now I want to go look at the at the work myself because yeah. I'm stabbing in the dark here, you know. But um, yeah. there's no doubt. you you got to watch fat. I mean, as I've gotten older... Right when you're middle age, you become a poor carbohydrate metabolizer. Now I do what I can with with exercise to correct that, but that sort of comes with age. But I also have to watch fat. I cannot go nutso glugging olive oil into my evening vegetables and stuff anymore. I mean, I'm pushing fifty now, you know, and I can't. The calories add up really fast. And although calorie counting, I'm not a huge fan. A friend of mine who's a professor, I'm kind of warning her like. You know, she's she's got she's just discovered like the My Fitness Pal, and she's counting every calorie and trying to balance mm-hmm. it with exercise. I'm like, yeah, exercise for the adaptations, for the structural differences. Yeah. It's not anti-eating, you know. So careful with that. That's a dark path, you know. But at the same time, energy balance. It it is. It's not the end all be all, but it is sort of the beginning point for weight management. I would think whether you want to add muscle or lose fat, calories matter. And fat calories add up really fast. I mean, two and a half times as fast as, as carb yeah. calories, you know. So uh, I think that's, I, I don't know. I, I want to go back and, again, look at how they self-select and how, like like Mike said, the hedonic controls and, oh, I'm full now. I'm satiated now, you know, uh, stuff like that. But, yeah, there's definitely training and probably some species differences. And people forget that science is very – reductionist and journalists love to over conclude so is this good or is this bad or fat is what makes us all fat well it sounds like it looks like fat is what makes dietary fat is what makes mice fat in that particular study study yeah. right yeah set of parameters yeah. but i think we have to be careful saying that that's fat is what makes people fat you know i don't know i i tend to think that a society wise 
we have a little bit more of a problem with the onset of you know high fructose corn syrup and everything we're consuming a thousand percent more than we did when i was a kid uh and at least when i remember and again this isn't very scientific but people ate more fat we would sit down and we would have a uh, medium fat meat item some vegetables and a, and a carbohydrate for dinner a pasta potato some kind of whole food thing and there was there weren't many fat people back in the 70s when i was a little kid you know yeah. um so something we're doing is weird and yeah it could be the fat content too i mean jesus i was at chili's a few weeks ago with uh my buddy and, and colleague ron uh and they were complying with that fda stuff about putting calories on the menu holy god i'm like <laughs> i'm like look at this burger has 1860 calories and and ron's like look look 2190 and i'm like you, you know that is a, that's in one sandwich right so when you put stuff like the barbecue sauce and the chili cheese fries and the egg on the cheese and everything's on top of that burger you can start to see how this stuff happens right we're talking about i mean 2000 calories that's what a typical american woman eats all day in a, in a sandwich and a lot of that is from the fat. I, I mean, I'll definitely give them that, right? You can definitely get very fat in a low sugar environment, but we don't live in a low sugar environment. I tend to think the combination is is what's what's most detrimental. But it sounds like in that particular study, Phil, you were saying adding the sugar didn't really make much of a difference to the fat, mm -hmm. and that that's surprising to me. But you're right; that set us off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, three things here quickly from the science news world. This first one was uh, from that same colleague that I was talking about was calorie counting a lot lately. Uh, humanities professor, so not a um, not a science prof, but um, this is from Science Daily. The scent of coffee appears to boost performance in math. The scent. Now, hmm. this is interesting to me because I had two students last year look at the smell of coffee uh, on asthmatic symptoms one of them was asthmatic and she swears every time she walks into a starbucks she can breathe freely and i'm like well maybe there's some antioxidants and so we started looking at you know the solubility and the vaporizability of different phytochemicals and um so I, this caught my eye when, when she sent this it says smelling a coffee like scent which has no caffeine in it creates an expectation for students that they will perform better on tests so um, this is spanking new stuff from Stevens Institute of Technology. It says drinking coffee seems to have its perks in addition to the physical boost that it delivers. And, of course, that's what my lab mostly looks at, right, is non-fatiguing physical boost. Uh, coffee may lessen our risk of heart disease, diabetes, and dementia. We've talked about that in recent weeks. Coffee may even help us live longer. We've talked about that in recent weeks. Um, now there's more good news. Researchers at Stevens Institute of Technology reveal that the scent of coffee alone may help people perform better on the analytical portion of the Graduate Management Aptitude Test, or GMAT, a computer adaptive test required by many business schools. So this was done by a business professor, Adriana Madzaroff, uh, recently published in the Journal of Environmental Psych. Quote, it's not just the coffee-like scent helps people perform better on analytical tasks. Uh, which was already interesting, says Madzaroff, but they also thought they would do better, and we demonstrated that this expectation was at least partly responsible for their improved performance. So I, again, interesting stuff. Uh, we, what we've actually seen, and this is not sweeping, this is just what I've seen. Uh, I had some students look at um, physical and psychostimulant responses to uh, via instant coffee it's identical decaf and water and the interesting thing was for cognitive tasks like we're talking about in this paper um there was a trend um the real coffee did the best they, they felt the most alert and um, focused and you know that sort of thing on real coffee but there was a trend a statistical trend like a p.06 for you stats people um for the via instant decaf the decaf to enhance people they, they thought they felt more uh, focused alert and energized uh, now the interesting thing is on the cognitive test you could see some effects on physical stuff like benching you had to have the real deal it was the mm. real coffee I was just tweeting uh, I just tweeted the study in fact yesterday that we did about this so it looks like 
you know, you can fool your mind maybe into being more alert or even doing better on a test. Uh, just with anticipation, right? Because that's what they're after here. Is, is is it this pleasurability of the scent? Probably some. Is it the fact that they're anticipating? Like, oh, is this the real deal coming down the pike to me? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and again, what we saw that affected the cognition more than it did actual, like, pec and triceps activation, if you will. You know, uh. so... Uh, still interesting stuff that the smell alone because I think about pre-workout pills and powders or you know having a pre-workout ritual that we've talked about before um, if you're convinced it's coming and it probably really is coming if it's the real deal um, maybe open label is is actually more realistic you know than than trying to find the right um, placebo right because this 50% anticipation you get when you're presented with a hot brown liquid that's either real or fake coffee, that anticipation changes your your neurochemistry. I think, you know. So, yeah, yeah. I always think of that too. I'm maybe working on a more cognitive type supplement, and in terms of designing a study for it, it's it's like what is again goes back to what is your goal. Like on one hand, I'm like, well, I would love to see just water versus you know whatever the supplement is. And then, then the flip side is, well, that's not really that real world, right? So if it's something you add to coffee or something like that, eh, it's not as applicable then per se, right? Because it's do you, are you looking to see what is the greatest effect or are you trying to tease out what is kind of the mechanism? Yes, and exactly. And you, you'll get criticized on, on both, both ends, yep. right? Because if you yep. find the thing that is the the most efficacious it probably involves adding it to the coffee the the ritual and the smelling and all this stuff and then you'll have people that are like oh but you're artificially biasing them in that direction it's like well what if i'm just looking for what is the greatest effect right and i'm not super interested in what the mechanism is because mm. at the end of the day someone wants to know does what i'm doing work right and part of yeah. that may even be a placebo and other things but if you want to know, okay, what is the exact mechanism? Okay, now you're going to play around with the individual ingredients. It's going to be a lot more highly controlled, and it's probably going to take a series of studies to try to figure that out too. I once had a supplement company owner actually say, Lonnie, I wish you would compare, and I'm going to try to refrain here, uh, that our energy drink, I wish you would compare it to water and not with an yeah. identical placebo. And of course, they're interested in that because water has no anticipation and you can almost right. guarantee that it's going to work. But he kind of has a point, right? At least for yeah. cognitive stuff. It, again, in our little lab, and we're small potatoes, but you can, in fact, the anticipation. So in that case, instead of a hot brown liquid, it would be a cold red liquid. But either way, it might be the special one and that 50% anticipation. So you're, you're going to compare a robust effect on cognition on mental functioning to a mild effect and that's not going to be as exciting as comparing a robust effect to zero <laughs> you know yeah but I, again I now though that I know I think it might have been um, one of my students Bridget uh, who actually did the, the some of these comparisons but the the interesting because pain meds are this similar thing the anticipation mm -hmm. of a pain med it's really hard so stuff like caffeine or aspirin or ibuprofen it's hard to tease this part because like you said Mike you're damned if you do and if you're damned if you don't yeah what whatever you <laughs> compare it to Dawn Anderson who's a friend of ours another uh, caffeine and coffee researcher she did a great talk at the ISSN meeting I think it was 2016 uh, about this like what do you use yeah. as a placebo what do you compare the product to you know, let me let me just end this by saying, uh, here's another quote from this recent news blurb from Science Daily. The team designed a follow-up survey conducted among more than 200 new participants, quizzing them on their beliefs and the various scents um, and their perceived effects on human performance. Um, participants believed they would feel more alert and energetic in the presence of a coffee scent compared to a flower scent or no scent. So again, yeah, it's it's the biopsycho thing, you know, a biopsychosocial. It's to your point, Mike. Are you interested in purely the chemical, biological effect of what's in that coffee? Well, that's going to be a different um, research design than something that's like real world application, you know, where there's anticipation and all this stuff. So, I just thought that was neat, though. So, yeah, use that on your way to the gym. You know, if you have an actual cup of coffee and you're smelling it in the car on the way. Um, 
it's it's part of the process at least at least cognitively maybe not the physical performance from the scent alone but let's face it if you're very alert and focused that's good too so yeah and one of the sneaky things that almost all supplement companies know now but the color of the pill makes a difference right so blue in general is associated with more relaxing so if it's a pre-bedtime type thing blue is probably better yeah, if it's a yeah. pre-workout type thing, red's actually better. And there's some data on that. I think the only country where those are reversed supposedly was Italy, where blue was more of a stimulation effect. Hmm. Theory was because one of their main sports teams is blue. <laughs> but, yeah, even stuff like that, because you're kind of tweaking, not really the placebo, but your, that perception and what colors are even associated to you can see statistical differences too yeah this harkens back to what we were saying uh, about anticipation and all that kind of stuff yep. i mean um even a few weeks ago cup shape round cups people perceive the coffee as sweeter right and mm. so w when you uh, literally and that's from the ift uh, journal slash magazine it's sort of a quasi lay thing but um if that's true this is where the mouse studies start to fall apart a little right because mouse aren't drinking from a square <laughs> versus a round mug or, or a, a certain color um that's presented to them by a marketer very purposely manipulating them you know stuff like that so um one last little bit here because we're running out of time i know phil's got to uh, get to the gym um both of the the first one caught my eye and then i followed up with a quick blurb but um High body mass index is associated with the extent of muscle damage after eccentric exercise. This is from Kim and So, uh, brand new this month, uh, International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Uh, the present study aimed to investigate the effects of body mass index, so weight for height, right, uh, on the change in muscle damage after eccentric exercise. So we're changing gears on topic here quite a bit, but they took 40 healthy male uh, college students this is a Korean paper. They did the preacher curl. Um, they did two sets of 25 negatives. So they rocked their little biceps mm -hmm. pretty good. Uh, about half the guys had a low body mass index. So they weren't very heavy for their height. Their body mass index ranged from 18.5 to 23. So not very big. Um, their high body mass index group doesn't sound high to us, <laughs> but it's mm -hmm. 25. Um, I mean, even after my 20 pound weight loss that I'm, I'm pleased that I did, I'm still 28, 29, you know, um, a lot of lifters are around 30, which looks actually obese when you compare us to gen pop. But anyway, so they looked at basically very low twenties, uh, to a 25, uh, body mass index, uh, results, loss of maximum strength muscle soreness and creatine kinase levels so damage marker in the blood were higher in the high body mass index group than in the normal what they called body mass index group or what i would call the thin dudes uh, in conclusion body mass index is one of the potential factors related to muscle damage after eccentric exercise now this caught my eye because on one level no offense to the researchers but duh like if you have more muscle mass, <laughs> you more mm -hmm. muscle mass. Oh look, you have, you're dumping more creatine kinase. I mean that's something that I yeah. I clearly saw in the lab. You got more tissue to tear up. So when you tear it up, it dumps more damage markers into your blood. Like bigger biceps because of the higher body mass index. Oh look, more damage. You know, shocker, yeah. right? Um, but it did. I did find it interesting though in their defense that the loss of strength uh, was greater. Um, I can see higher creatine kinase levels, more muscle soreness, right? Because there's more biceps there to actually get sore, <laughs> you know. Um, but they lost more strength after doing this, you know, compared to baseline than the thin little dudes. So uh, there's so many variables, though. Yeah. I mean, okay. Um, Let's have what it. What <laughs> is the what is the body fat percentage of the high BMI guys? You know, are they potentially just fat? Well, it says healthy. <laughs> That's all it says is healthy. But you're right. Oh, you could be pretty fat. God. Yeah. Yeah. You know. That's true. That's true. So, yeah, this is not body comp for sure. Yeah, you know, because um, I'm I'm like a 36, <laughs> and, I, and I've lost 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. Yeah, there's no doubt. We're <laughs> anybody who's a lifter is a is a grotesque outlier paying high risk yeah. insurance if their insurance yeah. agency knows what their body mass index is. Yeah. 
Um, no, it's a good point though. If they were, if their body mass index was 25, just because they had more body fat and their muscle mass wasn't any different. I don't have that information here, right? And I don't even know, they don't even mention body comp. Um, but yeah, they, they were concluding that high body mass index is related to muscle damage and, you know, and loss of strength uh, after the eccentric stuff. May, like I said, it may simply be that you're on gross numbers. You gotta be very careful the way you analyze this, right? Because I did this with men and women in the past. It's really hard to compare some of this stuff. You have to do it as a percentage or compare it to baseline. Because let's, I mean, let's say for example, the big, bigger guys, they lost 20 pounds off of their preacher curl maximum strength. And the little guys only lost eight pounds. Well, relative to their body size, that that might that might be like ten percent for both of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, so absolutes are different. Absolutes are different, and that may be something that, that you got to be careful with. But they they were. Um, it was interesting. Like I said, the first thing that jumped to my mind was, oh, if they are heavier because there's additional muscle mass there. And let's face it, I mean, mm -hmm. I doubt that it's just fatness, but um, yeah, yeah, you. you, you it, like I said, I, I saw huge creatine kinase numbers in some of the bodybuilders that I studied in the lab. I mean, off the charts high, like CK levels of like 1,100, stuff like that. Like I, I, we're talking about like on a 200 scale people, you know, and it's because they're so beefy. You know, they're not normal. <laughs> they're not normal people. Yeah. Um, it's, anyway, so the quick follow up here. This is from last year, Journal of Exercise Rehabilitation 2017 from the same group, Kim and colleagues. Effect of compression garments on delayed onset muscle soreness and blood inflammatory markers after eccentric exercise, a randomized controlled trial. The purpose of this one was to investigate how compression garments applied after the eccentric exercise might affect delayed onset muscle soreness or inflammatory markers like creatine kinase or TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor. Um, they took 16 healthy university male students. It looks like they did the same thing. In fact, this may be from a, the same study. Uh, arm of the study, uh, all performance, all subjects performed two sets of eccentric exercise using elbow flexors, 25 reps per set on a preacher curl machine. So this is all the same, similar. They took uh, measurements at 24 hours after 48, 72, and 96. See, there we are again. By by day four, you're pretty much coming back to baseline. Um, muscle soreness also in the similar time frames. Uh, let's see. The compression garment group reported faster recovery of maximal isometric strength following exercise. And the p-value was 0.001. So that's probably either very consistent or a high magnitude of effect. Uh, the lower muscle soreness during the recovery period during the control group as well. So faster recovery of strength and lower soreness. However, no significant differences in CK activity or TNF alpha activity. I find that almost odd because uh, yeah. Pris Priscilla Clarkson back in the day, she showed that if you immobilize a wrecked, you know, a, a muscle that's been wrecked with negatives, um, you get less CK dumping into the bloodstream, right? Because it's just, it's immobile. You're not kind of flushing it and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they did show a picture of the compression garment. I'm looking at it here. It goes from basically the insertion of their deltoid all the way to the wrist. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting. I don't know about practical application. Maybe. If you know that you can't get, you need the, your strength back tomorrow, you know, uh, or within 48 hours, you need your strength and uh, back and your soreness gone because like you're going to perform like on the field, you know, or something like that. I can't imagine a power lifter getting sore right before a meet. That'd just be yeah. stupid, you know. Uh, but if you're on a team sport or something like that and you train to the point that you know you're going to do some negatives, um, the coach is, doesn't know what, what he's doing maybe <laughs> and has you do a negative before an event. The compression garment might help you with the strength. Um, I don't know. Like was that a, a group where they had a group that wore the compression garments and another group that did not, correct? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see a study where they did it per individual. Right? So go to the gym, exercise both arms, you know, measure both, mm -hmm. and then we'll just put like a compression garment only on your right yeah. arm. Yeah. Right. Now, obviously, you know which arm has it because of the perception and the change of proprioception and everything else. But I think that would be a little bit more interesting. I mean, it sounds it like your study was significant already, so maybe it doesn't buy you anything else. But I just think in terms of trying to reduce the amount of variability in crazy free-living humans, that, that may be useful. Yeah, it says there were eight in each group. Um, 
randomly assigned to either the compression group or the control group. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if this is a repeated measure design because it's exact number in each group, you know, but at the same right. time, yeah, the contralateral limb designs I always thought were so elegant, right? Like yeah. do all the negatives with your left arm and do concentric with your right or nothing with your right arm. I understand that systemically there is some crosstalk and all that kind of yes. stuff. You know, you see yeah, that in rehab and all that. But, but yeah, that would be cool because you're right. Genetically, uh, man, I, I, I've seen this a lot, that creatine kinase, some people are hyper responders and they dump it like crazy. I'm one of them, actually. Uh, and other people don't as much. So, yeah, to control for the genetic component yeah. of this and, and you, you know, and, and the, everything else, it'd be cool to do it in the same person. It's some kind of, yeah, contralateral repeated measures design. But anyway, it's it's sort of neat. And it does at least yeah, su suggest suggest a compression garment if you really want to make sure you're not sore the next day because you got to perform. I don't know. Maybe some, you know, um, sleeve of some kind, compression sleeve. Yeah. I'd like to see a chronic study too to show that there's no altering of the adaptation either, right? So we know like ibuprofen sometimes or cold water immersion, you can see performance come back, but it's at a cost of kind of those long-term adaptations also. Right, so, you, but you, you don't get the results. Maybe that exists, I just haven't looked at it in this literature yet. Yeah, you don't want to sacrifice the gains. Yeah. All right, folks, I think that's it. So we'll call it there. Just again, we had lots of mail and news and so we got to cover that stuff, but, you know, it keeps things current, so it's fun to discuss. Hi, everybody. Have a good day. All right. See you guys. Hey, listeners. Have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun, heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.